So again, sit in a way that's comfortable and at ease for yourself. I just finished a 10-day retreat in the residential retreat center with a number of the other Spirit Rock teachers and about a hundred practitioners that was, um, as they often are, it was quite wonderful, um, but somehow it felt even more um, dedicated, if you will, I believe partly because of the times that we're in. People were both grateful to be on retreat and motivated in some way to look deeply inside. So I began to reflect coming back from that retreat on what kind of teachings from the Buddhist tradition might be of use during this time, this week and perhaps in the weeks ahead. And it seems important, although uh, valuable to talk about the current situation in the world, to also speak of those truths or understandings that are timeless, that are beyond the current situation and dilemma. And in particular, to look for ways that help us keep our heart open and clear in this time. In the Buddha's teachings, it is said that the mind is naturally clear and radiant. Luminous is this mind, says the Buddha, brightly shining, though it becomes colored by the attachments that visit it. This unlearned people do not really understand and thus they do not have wisdom of the mind. Luminous is this mind brightly shining when it is free of attachments. Thus the noble followers of the way truly understand and for them there is indeed wisdom of the mind. There is a reality of consciousness that is part of our human nature beyond all the circumstances of joy and sorrow and gain and loss and praise and blame that we can discover, rest in, understand from which the dilemmas and the circumstances of life can be met wisely. We all know, I mean, it's almost uh, too obvious to repeat that the cause of our sufferings in the world, whether it's individual or collective, comes from the human heart primarily. As the Buddha said, suffering is caused by greed, hatred and delusion. And the ordinary person looks at the results while the wise person looks into the causes if they're suffering and difficulty. The wise person looks into the causes. So in a way, we are asked in these times to look into our own hearts and see and remember that place of freedom, openness, timeless peace. And at the same time, to look at and understand how to work with the forces of greed, hatred, fear, delusion, confusion, and so forth that are so strong in this human realm from the perspective of wisdom. Plato remarked at one point, only the dead have known the end of war. It's a kind of depressing statement, isn't it? <laughs> but Unfortunately, it's been accurate so far for the last 2,300 years or however long ago Plato made that statement. Um, and I might hope that it doesn't remain accurate in centuries ahead, but so far for this human realm, that's actually the reality, isn't it? I was talking the other day with my mother about this, who's very upset about the world situation. 
And she said, she said, you teach in Buddhism that people are basically good, that our hearts are basically good. I said, that's right, Mom. She said, well, she said, I think 95% of people are basically good and that the other 5% are so badly hurt or so badly traumatized in some way that we couldn't call them good at this point, although they, underneath that might be there. But it's only a small amount. That was her, her philosophy of the day. So that day I was meeting with another teacher here, Robert Hall, who was a psychiatrist and founder of the Lomi School, has done work both individually and collectively for, for many, many decades. And we were talking about my mother's statement, Robert and I. And I said, Robert, what do you think? Do, 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 you, have, do you have any sense of this? He said, that sounds pretty, pretty much right to me, that mostly we're good, and then there's some who are so wounded, so much in pain, that they can't touch that goodness so easily. And I said, so when you meet someone like that in your work with groups, because Robert's done all these decades of group work, what do you do when you have a group of, of people who are very good-hearted and then 5% of the group, one person or two people, are violent, um, are dis- destructive, are uh, filled with hatred or anger and so forth? What do you do in your work? And you said, well... First, I breathe. Remember this, right? This is going to be a theme tonight. First, I breathe. That is to make space. Then I acknowledge this is what's happening. And then I try to give that person the attention that's needed, if they're destructive or acting out or whatever is happening, to give them attention. And I enlist the others in the group as well. I say, this is what's going on in our group. It's true, he said, that one person in a group can take over the whole energy of the others. Everybody knows that. As can a small group of people in a very large society who are acting in some very strong way take the whole attention and energy of the society. He said, so what I do is to give them that attention because you have to. And he and I were kind of going back and forth because We've run groups together. I said, yeah, yeah, exactly, that's what we do. I said, then, all right, suppose it gets worse. Suppose, what do we do when it gets out of control? And he said, well, then there's a certain point where that person may need to be restrained for their own good or the good of the other people, possibly even locked up for their good or the good of other people. But most important, we actually have to pay attention and work with that energy. So the question for us in our practice at this point is how do we work with the energies that are touched in us by the terrorist attack in New York and by all the upheaval in the society and the world since then? What do we do? We all have been shocked at some point, but then being shaken up, we can get very touchy or it will affect our own trauma and we get frightened, uh, deeply afraid or touch the grief that we carry or we become on edge or quick to judge one another. All of these kinds of things get activated in us. And it's not just then those people, whoever your them is, who need to do the work of the heart at this time but all of us. How can a troubled mind understand the way, says the Buddha? Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. How's that? Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. And once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even a beloved mother or father. So we too have the responsibility to learn to work with our mind and all the energies within us. And the Buddha's instructions on discovering the freedom of heart, purity, the end of grief, the realization of liberation that is possible for you as a human being. He says, sit quietly, establish a quality of awareness and presence, breath, body, feelings in mind. He said, then become aware 
when desire and anger, when fear or agitation, when doubt or remorse arise. Become aware also when they vanish. Discover for yourself how they arise, what conditions bring these into your experience and what it means to free yourself from their grasp. Then, he goes on, you will know what it means to experience joy and ease, trust and equanimity and great compassion. How do we work with the energies in ourself? First important thing is the truth that we can't avoid them, just as we can't avoid suffering. Anybody here who's been able to avoid fear, judgment, doubt, confusion, anger, raise your hand. You can have your five dollars back. <laughs> In fact, these are part of the impersonal forces that run the, that run the lives of human beings in this human realm at, the time, at, at many times. They run the world. The world often runs on desire and greed, on hatred and prejudice, on racism and fear, as much as it also runs on understanding and love. They're big forces. And when we are caught in them, they keep us from seeing clearly. They keep our hearts from being soft and tender and connected with one another and this amazing earth that we're born into. So then the Buddha gives a number of the common examples that come in meditation. But I want to think about them tonight as they come in the course of our weeks, this time in the year 2001, in the fall of 2001. And how do we work with them to begin to examine? One of the first of these energies that come and are difficult for us, says the Buddha, is the energy of greed and desire and wanting. And we need to look at it as a cause in ourselves and in the world because it can be the source of tremendous suffering or, when understood, it can be the place of great liberation for us. First is to see it clearly. It is the state in us or in others that is not satisfied, that needs, that wants. And whether it's wanting more money or appreciation or a certain kind of security or beautiful things or certain kinds of pleasure or whatever it is, sometimes it's just the littlest thing. It's amazing. People can be on retreat and after a week or so there's, you know, there's really not much going on. Um, not much entertainment, you know, just your own <laughs> mind, which is kind of like, the, I don't know, the shopping channel or something <laughs> over and over again. And so there's nothing big to want, and the little want will come and tap you on the shoulder and say, well, you know, if only we could get one of those nice little meditation benches. I mean, you start in the beginning, and you want like a nice big estate on the bay and a, you know, a, a, and a, the perfect lover and great vacations and so forth. But after a while, you'll settle for, you know, I just want a sitting where my back doesn't hurt so much and a kind of a nice spot in the meditation hall where not near the door where people won't disturb me. And you see that no matter what situation, even in a prison cell where there's very little options, this, the wanting mind still comes. Where we are isn't enough. It's not just the outer things, but even more deeply, it's in the heart as a need to be seen and recognized and acknowledged. Another kind of very deep wanting. Someone said it's better to be wanted by the police than not wanted at all. <laughs> So 
So this is a really big force. And it comes all the time in our own lives. And it drives the world, endless longing, greed, have this, get that, do that, more and more, instead of contentment. How do we work with it? When you breathe, can you actually feel the wanting and not be lost in it? And it's very personal as well as collective. In a new book by Oriah Mountain Dreamer called The Dance, who did that, she wrote the poem, The Initiation. She tells a story of helping at a big local book fair where there there was a speaker who came who was sort of a new age speaker, well known. And she was, because her book was going to come out or something, she was helping um, at the table there with the books and things like that. And she wasn't so into the new age teachings, but anyway, everybody else who was there seemed enthralled with it. And, and finally, at the end, you know, she was um, there at the table helping to distribute the books and so forth. And one woman approached her as she was packing things up and asked about one of the meditation techniques that the speaker had said will change your life and get you everything you need and bring positive energy into your body and find you the right relationship and get you all the money and, you know, that kind of sell or whatever. <laughs> Deliver the power to manifest whatever you want as if getting what you want would actually satisfy you. You know what happens when you get what you want, don't you? You want something else, because wanting's endless. This small, thin woman in an oversized parka who introduced herself as Isabel, can I do this meditation on my own, she asked. Yes, I'm sure you can, although many people find it easier to have a group to help them. It's hard to keep discipline up on your own. But what will it give me? What will I get if I do this every day? Her tone took on a whining quality and I felt my own irritation rise as she continued. How fast will it work? Will I feel a difference after a week? How will I know if it's working? (laughs) This was exactly the thing I detested, the quest for the quick fix, the desire for guaranteed outcomes, the simple answer. Do this and you'll have everything you always wanted. I took a deep breath, looked at her, said, well, meditation is more of a process than a goal-oriented activity and went into this whole spiel about there's no way to know how quickly it will happen, trying to talk her out of the deluded state of mind. I picked up my bag and started to button my coat and started to veer away, but she grabbed my arm really strongly and said, but what I really want to know is, will it help me find God? If I meditate, will I have an experience of something or someone out there listening, something really with me? A wave of desperation swept out from her through me, and I was surprised to find my eyes filling with tears. This woman wasn't looking for an easy answer or a guaranteed formula because she was lazy. She didn't want a simple plan because she was unable to think critically about what would work. She wanted something she knew would work and work quickly because she was hanging on by her fingernails. She wanted something that would work quickly because she was afraid she simply wasn't going to make it through months and years in her life. So it's really important when we see the wanting and longing that is in us as human beings and the grief that it touches for not being seen and not being acknowledged, that we can honor and hold it with respect and compassion. All that's happened has put so many people in a vulnerable state. And there are all these things we want. A lot of it's just for comfort, to feel that things are okay. And at the same time, we also have to look if we're honorable in the causes and we breathe and we realize we can be with our own wanting, we have to look and see that there are some ways in which the wanting of our society is out of control and that some of the causes, certainly for why we are hated or why people are angry at us in other parts of the world, have to do with our collective greed. I mean, if you want to understand the politics of the Middle East and over the last 50 years, there's only one simple thing you need to study. 
oil, money. Seriously, you want to find out who the players are and what's been going on, that will illuminate it very, very deeply. Or another word for it is greed. And we all participate in our own ways in a society that has, perhaps unfortunately, marketed its values, which include consumerism, you know, and lack of the sacred. It's kind of lost in our culture. Trying, we, we market it all around the world, and so other places become, in a certain way, colonized. Think of the things that are killing us as a nation, said John Gatto, New York City Teacher of the Year. Drugs, brainless competition, recreational sex, the pornography of violence, gambling, alcohol, and the worst pornography of all, lives devoted to buying things, accumulation as a religion. All are addictions of dependent personalities, and that is what our brand of schooling is producing in our youth. And then it goes out to the rest of the world in some ways. Men and women are free to choose anything in economic societies except to opt out. The ultimate treason is to prefer to neither produce nor consume wealth. Cultures that do not believe in economics and the sale of goods and people must be developed out of existence. Roads, schools, and hospitals are the preferred weapons of destruction. I don't mean to say that capitalism is bad. There are good things about it. But greed is bad for us and for the rest of the world. And so somehow we have to, in our vulnerability, look at our own longings and needs and the longings and needs of our society honorably and tenderly and remember that they are not who we really are. How to work with these energies? First of all, to accept them. As William Blake said, those who enter the gates of heaven are not those who have no passions or have curbed the passions, but rather those who have cultivated an understanding of them. So we see them for what they are. The challenge is to not suppress, whether it's fear or anger or confusion, not to suppress them. Because you know what happens when you suppress stuff. It just gets locked in your body and after a while it comes out in your kidneys or your hips or your lungs or someplace else. You know that. And on the other hand, to discover that it's possible to work with the fears and the difficult energies without acting them out to bow to them as they arise, like the Buddha did to Mara under the Bodhi tree. Is that you, Mara? I see you. Mara said, oh, the blessed one has seen me again, kind of slinks out sadly. He knows me. Oh, it's you again, Mara. To sit with them, to breathe, to say, this is desire, this is longing, this is the longing to be seen or known or loved or fill myself up, you know, the hungry heart distract myself and to hold it in the space of wisdom of tenderness and compassion because when we're lost in it we think it's who we are and it isn't the truth it's not who we really are to breathe to bow to it to give it as much space as it needs to say show me your dance desire need longing Oh, it's so big. It's this great big monster. Far out. Look at that. Very impressive, aren't you? Thank you for your dance. And there you are breathing and saying, well, that was a big desire, wasn't it? Now what's the right thing to do? You understand? You already know this. And then it becomes possible in our vulnerability and tenderness to act not at the effect of these, but from the place of wisdom. Julian of Norwich, that wonderful saint, said, If there be anywhere on earth a lover of God who is not, excuse me, who is always kept safe, 
I know nothing of it, for such was not shown to me. Anywhere on earth, someone who's always kept safe. But this was shown, that in falling and rising again, we are always kept in that same precious love. You don't get what you want a lot of the time. And actually, wanting isn't the game. Awakening is. So we find the graciousness of heart with desire. Wanting. Personally. And then maybe we can understand it in the world and contribute to the sanity of the world. The same sanity is needed in relation to its opposite energy, says the Buddha. Instead of grasping aversion, aggression, anger, hatred, the strategy of pushing things away, condemning them, judging them, fearing them, hating them. It's so hard in these times because our own pain and trauma has been touched. And then you find people in some way being very sweet to one another. Are you okay? But on the other hand, there's also some short fuses out there where people are really irritable and frightened and upset. And they're overworked anyway, right? And then this adds to it. And don't think that it's easy for anybody. When we started the Gulf War and the bombing of Iraq, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master, was supposed to come and teach in America that week. And he couldn't do it. He said it made him so angry because he was in Vietnam for all those years when his country was being bombed. And to see America, even if it was wrong for the Iraqis to invade Kuwait, and one may have all kinds of views about that and what should be done. Even with that, to see... America bombing so extensively and now it's been 10 years he said I simply couldn't go to America it was I was too angry he said and I had to breathe <laughs> for days <laughs> before I could calm myself enough to say I actually need to go there this is what I have to do for my own practice as well as for them we all have ideas about how it should be done and who should do what on this earth and we get upset when they're not doing what we think they should. I think it was Gore Vidal who said, there's no human problem on earth that could, be not, could not be solved if people would simply do as I say. Right? <laughs> How do we work with anger, aggression, and the hatred that it can lead to the fear and hatred of others, the racism that's there that gets touched in us. The first important thing is to acknowledge it, to see it as it is, to give it space by trusting and knowing that it is not who we really are. Again, the story I read from my colleague and friend Michael Mead in working with groups of young people, especially those who've been in gangs, and he said, I was working with a group of young people one day, this, the, and we were writing poems. You know, imagine gang kids writing poems, but Michael and Luis Rodriguez, this fantastic Latino poet, um, a number of folks going in and reading poetry that is so honest about their lives that these young men say, yeah, I'm going to write that too. And this one kid gets up and says, I can't write nothing. And Michael said to him, well, if you can't write or the only thing that you have to say is curses, then go ahead, write as many foul things as you can, curse as thoroughly as you can. It's like my teacher Ajahn Chah when I was angry. And he said, okay, you're angry, good. He said, go in your hut, little tiny tin-roofed hut in the hot season, shut all the windows and doors, wrap yourself in your robes, sit in the middle of the fire and be angry and learn about anger. 